Picture a young woman, no more than 16 years old, enslaved on a plantation in the Deep South. She's pregnant with her first child, a child that she knows will not be her own. She's scared, but she's also filled with hope that maybe, just maybe, her child will have a better life than she has. As her belly grows, so do her fears. She watches as other pregnant women on the plantation are worked to the brink of exhaustion, forced to carry out the same grueling work as the other enslaved people. But she knows that if she can't keep up, her punishment will be severe. As her due date approaches, the fear turns to terror. She knows that childbirth is dangerous for any woman, but for an enslaved woman, it's even more so. There are no doctors to help her, no midwives to guide her. All she has is the other enslaved women on the plantation, who will do their best to help her through the ordeal. But the horrors don't end there. If she survives childbirth, she'll be expected to return to work in a matter of days. She'll have to care for her newborn while working in the fields, with no time to rest or heal. And if her child is taken away from her, as was often the case, she'll have to suffer the heartbreak of knowing that she may never see her baby again. This is the reality that enslaved women face during pregnancy and childbirth. And yet, it's a reality that is often hidden from history. When we learn about slavery in school, we're taught about the brutality of the system, but we're rarely taught about the specific horrors that pregnant women faced. In this video, we will uncover the hidden history of the inhumane treatment of enslaved women during pregnancy and childbirth, and shed light on the voices that have been silenced for far too long. Before that, kindly hit the subscribe button below and leave a like on the channel. The idea of breeding enslaved people like cattle was not new. It was a deliberate and systematic practice aimed at increasing the number of slaves and therefore the wealth of slave owners. Let's take a step back in time to the early 1600s when the transatlantic slave trade began. The first enslaved Africans were brought to Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. At this time, slavery was not yet based on race, but on the fact that you were taken captive and sold into slavery. However, this would soon change. As slavery became more profitable, laws were put in place to ensure that enslaved Africans remained enslaved for life and could be passed down from generation to generation. The enslaved were considered property and were treated as such. They were bought and sold at will and had no rights. By the 1800s, slave breeding was a profitable business and breeding farms and breeding houses were established across the country to facilitate the practice. One such breeding farm was in Virginia, owned by a despicable man named Thomas Jefferson. Yes, the same Thomas Jefferson who wrote that all men are created equal while he owned over 600 slaves, many of whom he bred like animals. This man, who we are taught to revere as a founding father, was an enslaver who saw nothing wrong with using enslaved women as breeding machines. But it wasn't just Jefferson. This practice was widespread, and many other slave owners saw nothing wrong with it. They saw their female slaves as nothing more than property, to be used and abused at their whim. Think about that for a moment. Enslaved women, already stripped of their humanity, were used for their reproductive capabilities, their children taken away from them at birth, and sold like commodities. The emotional trauma of being separated from one's child is unimaginable, and it was a reality for countless enslaved mothers. One of the most notorious breeding farms was called The Weeping Time, which was located in Savannah, Georgia. This farm was owned by Pierce Mees Butler, a wealthy plantation owner who inherited the farm from his grandfather. Butler was a cruel and heartless man who saw nothing wrong with using enslaved women as breeders. Shockingly, he is also one of the founding fathers of the United States of America. The conditions in these breeding farms and houses were deplorable. The women were forced to live in small, cramped quarters with little to no ventilation. They were given barely enough food to survive, and their medical needs were completely ignored. Pregnant women were forced to work in the fields up until the day they gave birth. And even after giving birth, their babies were taken away from them and sold to other plantation owners, while the women were forced to continue working. These women were denied the basic right to be mothers and to care for their children. One woman in particular stands out in my mind. Her name was Harriet Jacobs, and she was enslaved in North Carolina. Harriet was forced to have a sexual relationship with her owner, and as a result, she became pregnant. Her owner's wife became jealous and started to mistreat her. Harriet knew that her child would be taken away from her, so she decided to run away and hide in a small attic space in her grandmother's house. For seven years, Harriet lived in that small attic space, watching her children grow up without her. 
This is just one of the many horrific stories that show that detail the sufferings of enslaved women in the U.S. Enslaved women were not only forced to have breed with men who were specifically chosen to produce the best possible offspring, but also denied the basic right to care for their children. But the horrors did not end there. Enslaved women were subjected to cruel and dangerous birthing practices that often resulted in injury, infection, and death. They were often forced to give birth on the plantation floor, with no medical assistance or pain relief. They were sometimes subjected to barbaric practices, such as the breaking of the pelvis that was designed to restrain and subdue them. The breaking of the pelvis was intended to widen the birth canal and facilitate the delivery of the baby, but it was done without anesthesia and often resulted in permanent damage to the woman's body. The procedure involved the use of a large instrument known as a pelvimeter, which was inserted into the woman's vagina to measure the width of her pelvis. If it was deemed too narrow, the operator would use a wooden spatula or other instrument to forcibly break or separate the pelvic bones, often causing extreme pain, trauma, and long-term physical disabilities. The use of a birthing chair was another method used to restrain and subdue enslaved women during childbirth. The chair was designed with straps or ropes to hold the woman's legs apart and a hole in the seat to allow the baby to be delivered directly onto the ground. This made it easier for the slave owner or midwife to catch the baby, but it also made it more difficult for the woman to move or control her body during labor. Enslaved women were often subjected to these and other barbaric birthing practices without their consent or understanding of what was happening to them. Even worse is that the media tries to hide this part of history. This is why there is limited written documentation about the breaking of the pelvis or the use of the birthing chair during slavery. During that time, enslaved women were often denied access to education and were not allowed to read or write, and due to the intentional suppression of their voices and experiences by those in power, they could not stand up against this barbarism or document them. However, there are some accounts and records that shed light on these barbaric practices. One such account is that of Harriet Jacobs, an enslaved woman who escaped from slavery in North Carolina in 1842. In her autobiography, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, Jacobs describes the use of the birthing chair and how it was used to restrain and subdue enslaved women during childbirth. She also describes the trauma and physical harm caused by the practice of the breaking of the pelvis, which she witnessed firsthand. Another account comes from a physician named James Marion Sims, who performed dreadful experiments and surgeries on enslaved women. It is worth noting that these practices were not limited to the United States, but were also used in other parts of the world where slavery existed, such as the Caribbean and South America. There are accounts of the use of the birthing chair in Jamaica, for example, and of the breaking of the pelvis in Brazil. You might think that the trauma comes to a stop here. However, pregnant women on slave breeding farms faced more horrors than you would ever imagine. These women were also used for medical experiments and surgeries. Doctors used would use them as subjects for experiments that included things like testing out new surgical procedures, testing out new drugs and medications, and even using them as guinea pigs for medical research. One of the most infamous examples of this was the work of Dr. James Marion Sims, who is often referred to as the father of modern gynecology. Dr. James Marion Sims is a well-known figure in the medical field for his pioneering work in gynecology. However, his work was built on the exploitation of enslaved black women who he experimented on without anesthesia or their consent. Sims believed that black women did not experience pain in the same way as white women and therefore did not see the need to provide anesthesia during his surgeries. Sims conducted numerous experiments on enslaved women and sometimes performed up to 30 surgeries on a single woman. Many of these surgeries were done to treat conditions like vesicovaginal fistulas, which are a complication of childbirth that cause incontinence. Sims experimented on a woman named Anarcha, who had suffered from vesicovaginal fistula for years. This condition is caused by prolonged and obstructed labor and leads to a hole between the bladder and the vagina. The condition causes incontinence, making it difficult for women to control their bladder. During surgery, Sims often used whatever tools he had on hand, including a shoemaker's awl and a borrowed silver spoon from his wife. He continued to perform these surgeries on black women for years until he found a successful surgical technique that he then used on white women, who were given anesthesia during the procedure. Enslaved women who eventually have children had no say in the lives of their babies. These were babies were not considered theirs from the start, but rather the property of their white masters.
These children were often taken away from their mothers as soon as they were weaned, sometimes as early as six weeks old, and sold off to other slave owners. They were considered nothing more than commodities, to be traded and used however their owners saw fit. The conditions under which these children were raised were beyond horrific. They were often forced to work from a very young age, doing backbreaking labor in the fields or in the homes of their masters. They had no rights, no freedoms, and no hope for a better life. They were born into slavery, and their fate was sealed from the moment they took their first breath. One particularly horrific example of this practice occurred in Louisiana in the mid-1800s. There was a plantation owner named James H. Whitaker who owned over 300 slaves. Whitaker was known for his particularly cruel treatment of his slaves, and he had a reputation for selling off the children of enslaved women as soon as they were weaned. In fact, Whitaker had a nursery on his plantation where he kept the babies of enslaved women until they were old enough to be sold. The conditions in the nursery were appalling. The babies were kept in dirty, cramped conditions and were often sick and malnourished. When they were finally sold, they were taken away from their mothers forever, never to see them again. But it wasn't just Whitaker who engaged in this horrific practice. It was common throughout the South, and it continued throughout the entire period of slavery in the United States. Mothers were forced to watch as their children were ripped away from them, never to be seen or heard from again. Children were forced to grow up without parents, without love, and without hope. In fact, this practice was so common that it was even codified into law in some states. In Virginia, for example, a law was passed in 1662 that stated that the status of a child was determined by the status of its mother. This meant that even if a child's father was a free man, if its mother was a slave, the child was born into slavery. This law remained in effect until the end of slavery in the United States, and it led to the systematic separation of families and the selling off of children as soon as they were weaned. It's estimated that over 400,000 children were born to enslaved women in Virginia alone, and many of them were sold off to other slave owners, never to see their families again. As we look back on this dark chapter in our history, we must remember that the legacy of slavery still lingers today. We must acknowledge the ways in which racism and inequality continue to affect black women's lives and work towards a future where every person is treated with dignity and respect. We cannot forget these stories, and we must do everything in our power to make sure that something like this never happens again. Let us learn from the past to create a better future, one where we no longer tolerate the mistreatment of any human being. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to subscribe to stay on the channel and get more videos like this.